Good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you to our weekly resident lecture, which is given today by Dominic Birre. Dominic is a six-year postgrad in our department, and she will move forward soon to her research fellowship, and she will give an interesting talk on the Rolling Stones. Please. Good morning from my side, and thank you very much, Professor Petrovsky, for the introduction. Today's topic is uh, the Rolling Stones and their complications. Well, I'm not quite familiar with what problems the Rolling Stones encountered during their life as a rock band, but they can appear from benign to um, wild horses or truly malignant. And um, to make to draw a connection to the Rolling Stones in our body, um, they can benign resting gallstones in the gallbladder, asymptomatic, uh, or to say it in a Rolling Stones song, they become wild horses, move on to a cystic duct, and become real beasts of burden when moving a little bit further and obstructing the main pancreatic duct. Our talk today is um, structured in an anatomic route and an extra anatomic route. And um, I invite you today to join me on a gallstones journey through the anatomic route first. Um, and then we move along to the extra anatomic route. In the content, we will focus on the surgical treatment of asymptomatic and symptomatic gallstones, um, the acute cholecystitis, Meritzi syndrome, cholecystitis, biliary pancreatitis, and we will um, talk about the bilioenteric fistula, gallstone ileus, and Bouveret syndrome. 10 to 15 percent of the U.S. populations have gallstones, and only 10 to 25 percent of them become symptomatic. And um, in one year, in the United States, 800,000 amcholecystectomy are performed. So the, the European Association for the Study of the Liver have published guidelines for the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of gallstones. And when we have symptomatic and asymptomatic gallstones, the question is, when should we perform the cholecystectomy? And when you have gallstones, um, as marked in red, um, which have um, become symptomatic, it's a preferred option to perform a cholecystectomy. When you have an asymptomatic gallstone patient that was found by um, accident on an emergency ultrasound, for example, um, it's not recommended to perform a routine treatment uh, with cholecystectomy. But then there's still the question, when should you perform the cholecystectomy? And in their opinion, and also in our clinic's opinion, we should perform the cholecystectomy as early as possible for patients with uncomplicated biliary colic because the operation is much easier to perform at that stage. But what happens now if the stone is proceeding and impacting the cystic duct? An acute cholecystitis <coughs> is developing um, due to um, fluid secretion, intraluminal, and uh, prostaglandin I2 and E2 secretion, which increase the redness and the inflammation, the general inflammation of the gallbladder. The gallbladder is, gets distended, the, edema, the, the gallbladder wall gets edematous, and due to um, bradykinin and histamine, which are also secreted, the peripheral nerval endings are sensibilized and the patient starts to feel pain. And seeing that in an operation room, you get um, first a um, hyperemic um, a mucosa, which can be patchy. As you can see, um, it, this can um, proceed up to a necrotic gallbladder wall on the bottom right-hand corner. If this gets worse due to a um, microcirculatory um, problem, when bacterial overgrowth can cause a secondary bacterial infection of the gallbladder wall and it become a gangrenous called cystitis. An empyema, usually um, subhepatic, um, can <coughs> appear or it can become even an emphysematous called cystitis. As you can see on the computer tomography on the right side, um, here you have uh, where the arrow is, you have air in the gallbladder and you have an aerobili here in the liver. They're usually associated with a clostridium infection. And does anyone know which clostridium type this kind of um, emphysematous cholecystitis can cause? 
is it the clostridium perfringens? Yes, exactly. Thank you. So in this case, we shouldn't wait, and we should um, um, operate the patient immediately. There is no role for delayed surgery or postponing it to the next day. But what do we have on a study? When to perform um, this cholecystectomy when you have an acute cholecystitis, not in a gangrenous emphysematous cholecystitis. So this is a study by GUT. Um, it's a multi-center randomized um, trial. They enrolled 618 patients and 304 received an immediate cholecystectomy in uh, less than 24 hours and 340 patients became a delayed chol laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, first, antibiotic treatment, and after seven days to 45 days, <coughs> the operation. And the result of this study was that they got the significant differences in the morbidity score, in hospital stay, and hospital costs. The conversion rate um, was the same. And when we look at the meta-analysis, um, comparing the different randomized trials on an early versus delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy, it also is also in the favor of early laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Then um, Hula published in 2016 a new study where it's uh, said that an early laparoscopic cholecystectomy for acute cholecystitis can perform safely even 72 hours after the beginning of the symptoms and is still associated with less overall morbidity, shorter hospital stay, duration of antibiotic treatment, as well as reduced cost compared with delayed cholecystectomy. In the summary, we can say the ESL guidelines still promote that an early laparoscopic cholecystectomy, preferably within these 72 hours, um, should be performed early and should be performed by a surgeon with adequate expertise and pati for patients with acute cholecystitis. <coughs> now moving on to the next topic um, of the Meritzi syndrome. <coughs> Does anyone know what the Meritzi syndrome is? It's the obstruction um, of, a, of the hepatic duct through a stone in the, in the cystic duct. Um, exactly. So the Meritzi syndrome is characterized exactly by an obstruction of the proximal bile duct um, due to an extrinsic compression by either an impaction of the stone, as you said, uh, in the gallbladder neck, or it can be local inflammatory processes. Also, this is a rare syndrome in the developed countries. It appears in 0.7 to 1.4 percent of the cases. Um, the preoperative diagnosis has to be very carefully managed and an essential um, in order order to avoid bilio, um, vascular injuries and misdiagnosed malignancies. So we have different types of the Meritzi syndrome. Um, it's the severity from type 1 to type 4. Um, it's just a question of how much is eroding the gallbladder wall and how much is protruding into the common bile duct. So it's rare, but we have to remember and think about it. It may range from asymptomatic to obstructive jaundice, and the diagnosis is often very difficult. <coughs> so Kulkami has um, tried to, in their retrospective um, chart view of 4,900 patients, and that underwent cholecystectomy uh, in a single institution during six years, um, to observe which which Meritzi syndrome types have developed cancer, which Meritzi syndromes had to be laparoscopic or could be laparoscopically operated and which had to be converted to an open operation. And they found of all these patients, 60 patients that had a Meritzi syndrome. Type 1 were 16 patients. And um, type 2 Meritzi syndrome, so they had already a little erosion to the gallbladder wall. Um, were attempted in nine cases laparoscopically and all of them had to be converted to an open operation. So as a summary or to draw a conclusion, um, if you know that you have a Meritzi syndrome, it's better to think of an open access initially. If the stone though is moving more, 
a third to the common bile duct. We are a cholelithiasis, and this happens in five to twenty percent of the patients. Uh, it's mostly secondary, and primary is in rare, only in rare cases. And you can see on the on the uh, imaging a dilated common bile duct. <coughs> so. How should we treat a patient with cholelithiasis? And the American Association for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy categorized risk factor in order to um, figure out whether the patient has a high risk um, for having a cholelithiasis. <coughs> and here you can see a table um, seeing if you have a very strong risk factor, you have a strong or moderate risk factor, and what the likelihood is to have a cholecholithiasis. Having these facts then, you can choose your management option. And so if you have a high risk, um, according to this table before, you should perform a preoperative ERCP. If you have an intermediate risk, you can think of a laparoscopic intraoperative cholangiography and make a laparoscopic common dial duct exploration or perform a postoperative ERCP. The other option is to perform an endosonographic ultrasound or MRCP, and in a positive case, you can still the, perform the preoperative pre ERCP. With a low risk, obviously, we can perform a laparoscopic cholecystectomy without cholangiography. And now we move on to the real <coughs> beast of burden um, from the gallbladder stones, uh, the biliary pancreatitis. It's uh, the most common cause of an acute pancreatitis. This can be lethal, lethal for the patient. Um, <clears throat> the biliary pancreatitis accounts for 50% of all the pancreatitis. And um, as we said, it's, it can be very mild to very severe and necrotic. So when should we operate in a patient who has uh, acute biliary pancreatitis and we know we have to take out the gallbladder? The EASL says clearly that the cholecystectomy should be performed during the say hospital admission and that is the preferred option for mild and acute biliary pancreatitis. So I have a case um, from our hospital. It's a 60 year old patient and, and uh, in the beginning of the July he was referred to our hospital with symptomatic cholecystolithiasis. It was first indicated in 2014 and the surgery was indicated. We were discussing with him the operation but he had already plans uh, to go on his holidays and um, so we postponed the planned operation. Then, in the end of July, he was uh, referred back to us from Pristina, Kosovo, with acute necrotizing pancreatitis. And um, as you can see on the, on the computer tomography, the <coughs> pancreas is um, dilated, is edematous, is, um, has necrotic part. But we chose a step-up approach um, with an in, in, in initial interventional drain placement. And there was an instant <coughs> emptying of 1.5 liter of cloudy liquid. <coughs> In the second step, by recurrent vomiting and recurrent infection and failure to advance diet, um, we use a video-assisted retroperitoneoscopic debridement. And then two days later, we had to make an open approach and with a necrosectomy, splenectomy and cholecystectomy. And unfortunately, in this case, from a very mild um, gallbladder, symptomatic gallbladder disease, um, this became fatal for the patient. So what happens when the gallbladder stone doesn't go its normal way, but chooses to take a shortcut to the duodenum? Um, <clears throat> this is called the bilioenteric fistula. Um, bilioenteric fistula can cause different problems. They can cause gallstone ileus, or they can cause gastric outlet obstruction. And the different um, ways the gallbladder can cause different fistula formation to the duodenum, to the um, co um, colon, or even to the um, um, stomach. And as you can see, it's most common that it's a cholecystoduinella fistula due to the anatomic um, proximity.
Um, facts on this gallstone ileus, it's in 1 to 3 percent of the small bowel obstructions and 0.3 to 0.5 percent of patients with gallstone disease um, will suffer from a gallstone ileus and the highest incidence is seen in elderly female patients. Fortunately, um, stones below 2 centimeters can pass the rectum. There's an increased risk for impactations when the stone is over 2 centimeters. So, Looking at the distribution of the, the stones in a gallstone ileus, in 73% the stones are seen in the terminal ileum. And um, please, any of the um, students or assistant doctors or residents, um, tell me why do they occur in the terminal ileum? Uh, due to the valve of Bauhin? Yes, exactly. So, hand on heart, who has heard from the Bouveret syndrome? Does anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, I will explain what it is and we will buy a case by looking at one case. It's a 65-year-old patient. <coughs> he came to the emergency room with uh, chief complaints of eating intolerance, nausea and vomiting <coughs> and weight loss. And a CT computer tomography <coughs> was performed. And as you can see, the as you can see, the stone here, something is not okay. Probably a stone here that is obstructing, and the stomach is dilated and uh, has lots of liquid. So it's a gastric outlet <coughs> obstruction. And this is exactly the problem in Bouveret syndrome. Um, the gallstone is obstructing a proximal duodenum so that the stomach cannot empty itself anymore. Consecutively, you have this gastric outlet obstruction. In this case, um, <coughs> the, in this Bouveret syndrome, the patient, the stone was um, um, taken out and the patient was good again. So, Moving on to the take-home messages um, for the surgical treatments. In a symptomatic cholecystolithiasis, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy should be performed. Acute cholecystitis, an early cholecystectomy is uh, proposed. Mirichi syndrome, we should think of it and we should initially choose the open approach if possible. Cholecystolithiasis is primary domain of ERCP at first. And in biliary pancreatitis, the cholecystectomy should be performed <coughs> during the hospitalization. And if you have a biliary fistula or gallstone ileus, you can still choose between a one versus two stage procedure. So if you have an ileus and a strongly inflamed situs um, in the fistula um, region, you can choose first to, to operate on the ileus and in the second stage um, operate the fistula. So think of it, um, gallstone disease may have many phases of clinical presentation. They could range from mild to life-threatening conditions and it should not be underestimated. And here I put the ESA, EASL guidelines again. It has about 670 references and um, this is what we used in this presentation as a recommendation for the surgical treatment. And uh, thank you very much for, the, for the listening. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, very important because that's a common disease and misdiagnosis, mistreatment may just result in death of the patient. So that's a very uh, important topic. I also like your Rolling Stone story because if we understand the pathogenesis, the pathway, then we understand the symptoms and very often logically we have the right treatments. The most common or common cause of death of patients is mixing cholangitis, cholecystitis with cholecystitis. When you would treat the cholangitis when the stone is in the common bile duct with a cholecystectomy and patient will die from sepsis after because you solve. Uh, there's a number of gray zones, I think, here that uh, all with the, the guidelines can be discussed you know, between ERCP or surgery. I think there's a few. So one, just a few comments that I took note to you. Importantly, the most frequent uh, gallstone is asymptomatic. You present that, and I saw in the guideline, which escaped to me, they put low evidence 
uh, that we should not do surgery or, or the low recommendation. The evidence we can always discuss. It's a, uh, it's really uh, a pretty pretty unclear definition. But they show uh, a low recommendation. That I think is not correct. Uh, I think here the asymptomatic gallstone should not be operated. Otherwise, you operate 30% of the women more than 65 of the age and you take the gallstone. There are exceptions, patients with gallbladder cancer in different area in Chile where really you need to take the gallstone very early because it evolved in cancer. But I think it's very clear and I think insurance may also not pay uh, if you operate just because you see gallstones. The problem is asymptomatic gallstone in symptomatic patient, meaning that they have problems, but unrelated to the stone, and you take out the stone and they still have the problem after. That's a more difficult uh, situation. Uh, as the comment, the, the I think it's clear the uh, acute cholecystitis should be operated right away. If you can, the evidence is very strong. You delay, it's not clear how long you should delay, and there's this study from Lausanne that you showed that we basically we should operate any time, regardless of the time, as soon as we can. This is also a little bit unclear. This is our policy here in some way, I mean, case by case. We have to see also the risk of surgery in the patients, etc. So sometimes it's better to give antibiotic because most of all of these cases will respond to antibiotics. So you can delay, it's probably more expensive. So it's a case by case, but we also have a bit this, uh, this philosophy here. You, I mean, you cover very well many topics. You could not with the gallbladder cancer. We should not also forget that gallbladder cancer is most of the time related to gallstones. Or not always, but most of the time, I don't have the exact figure, is also to symptomatic gallstones. So they have cholecystitis, recurrent cholecystitis that can go to cancer or can go, but the number of these cases, in fact, have gallstones, which have been almost no symptoms and develop cancer. It's not a reason to take out all the stones in the population, but 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 it can happen. So, I mean, it was very good good presentation. Thank you. Know if there is questions or comments, I got one question. There's always this discussion whether an acute uh, cholecystitis should be operated right away in the middle of the night, or whether it's safer to wait until the next day. Are there any data to compare the outcome of? night with this daylight surgery of acute cystitis? Yeah, um, so the recommendation said it should be done if you do it in an emergency setting of an experienced surgeon. So <coughs> that's the limitation. I think if you have just a cholecystitis and no severe cholecystitis, this is no rule for do it at night surgery like any other surgeries which we did last time, uh, because what can happen if you have an perhaps not so much experienced resident is alone, and we had this also in our department, that you could have severe injury to the vessels or bile ducts, so um, do it safe. So the story is different. If you have emphysema, tosis, cholecystitis, or even perforated cholecystitis, then you have to go. But for a laparoscopic approach, I would not do <coughs> it in the night. Uh, for some special part of uh, the population, like diabetic patients or pediatric patients with a symptomatic cholelitiasis, what is the management? For example, some guidelines state that uh, sickle cell disease should be operated in pediatric patients, and some used to say that diabetic patients should have an early cholecystectomy due to the rate of or the amount or the severity of infection they can develop. So w how are the guidelines nowadays here? So the PET guidelines, I cannot tell you because I'm not a PET surgeon. Um, with especially sickle cell anemia, so we should ask them. But um, if you have risk factors, uh, as you said, we should go for early cholecystectomy. Uh, this would eliminate also any delay in these high-risk populations. Um, but again, if you have, a choles if you have cholecystitis, <laughs> you come to the emergency room in the night, and you have diabetes, uh, there's no role to do it immediately, right away. So, but also don't, if you have a spot, don't postpone this and, you know. Thank you very much for your talk. I have a very specific question about uh, gallstone ileus from a bilianteric fistula. Would you just relieve the, the ileus and not touch the fistula? Or would you go for a fistula repair and cholecystectomy? How's the management in this case? It, it depends from patient to patient and then how severe uh, the inflammation process also in the 
in the fistula uh, is because sometimes it's a chronic inflammation that you have this fistula and it can be acute inflamed as well. And then you have in the distant part of the intestine, you have the, the problem of the ileus. So first you will want to relieve the patient from the ileus symptomatic or this ileus um, problem. And then you first operate on that. And in a second stage when the patient is better and maybe stable because maybe he's unstable before, then you choose to operate uh, the bilioenteric fistula. <coughs> I think you answered right. I mean, I think the first you need, the problem is the ileus. So you need to take that out, do an anterotomy, take it out without delay uh, for this. Then then it's unclear. And then usually that elderly patients, very poor conditions, etc. So very often the best is to let in peace. Just do that and nothing else. The question is when you should never attend in the middle of the night to fix the fistula. You end up in a disaster. The question is after whether you go. So there is some recommendation just to do an ultrasound to see if there is residual stones, if there is another big stone, the patient is in relatively good condition, uh, that's a justify to go back and to do it. It's not a benign surgery, it's clearly an HPB surgery, if you have fistula, you have risk of problems. If you have no stones in an elderly patient or very small stones with a fistula, then the best to keep the patient in peace and not do uh, anything in the logical way. So it's really case by case. Uh, situ it's pretty s rare situation. We don't see many gallstone ileus. We see, and we have an elderly population, we see more mesenteric ischemia, very frequent, but gallstone ileus, I don't know how many we see in the department here. We have seen a few. Uh, it's a single digit number in a year, at least, that come to us with this, uh, with this uh, condition. Perhaps one adjunct to this question is um, also you have to look at the type the type of fistula. So if you have a colodopo duodenal fistula, which is might much more complicated because also to repair, uh, comparison if you have only a small uh, um, uh, colonic fistula, which you might easier to repair in the same procedure. So this has to be also go into the equation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is regarding a moderate suspicion of common bile duct stones in the symptomatic, acutely symptomatic patients. Is the MRCP or the endoscopic ultrasound the preferred way to go? Well, there are some institutions, even in this country, like in Basel, they do in every gallstone disease an MRI. Even, even if there is no suspicion at all, even if there is no suspicion. So. We don't practice this. If you have a low suspicion, sometimes, in my opinion, is to wait a little bit and to see how uh, the blood test uh, develops. So usually they present with high transaminases, uh, elevated bilirubin, and if this is transitory within the first 24 uh, hours, that means you can observe a decrease, then you know you probably have a stone passage. Uh, and then you can, uh, you probably don't need an ESAP and can schedule the patient for cholecystectomy. But if the liver function tests are still increasing after 24 hours and the symptoms increasing, I think you should go to ESAP. <coughs> it's a clear domain for this, yeah. And indication for MRI in such a patient? Good question. Um, if you have enough time, you can do it, but usually if, uh, if you have an ultrasound, you have a localized stone in the common bile duct and you see even still rising enzymes, I would not delay with an MRI, I will go for ESCP. We have also our gastroenterologist here who could also make a comment. Huh? And the advantage of, of the imaging by endosonography, which is usually that what we do if it's not clearly a stone visible already in the transcutaneous ultrasound, is that you can then proceed immediately to therapy. So the MRCP imaging is nice, maybe for academic reasons, but doesn't really help you in the sense that you can then proceed to, to whatever treatment you choose. Well, I mean, make a comment, it depends on the institution and here. You treat patient also in function of what you have in a hospital. If you have no, some center, they cannot do RCPs or they are not uh, very good record and you may manage the patient differently than if you have a center with expert gastroenterology. So, uh, you know, in that situation, you may go for surgery up front, treat it, and then postoperatively, if it's needed, then you can still do the RCP and, and clean that up. If that's not the case, then you're a bit stuck because you may end up to the cholecystectomy and other more complicated operations. So I think here you have really to adjust to what is around you in terms of the surgery or what, what you may do. A special situation might be the situation after gastric bypass. Uh, 
And there, if you have like a symptomatic uh, gallstone disease after bypass and MRCP, might be a good option to get some preoperative clearance. What might be needed intraoperatively or even postoperatively? Should we take the gallbladder when you do this? Uh, uh, you know, you have asymptomatic uh, cholesterol stone in this gallbladder, which I imagine is not so rare. Should we take out here the gallbladder if there is no symptom when you do a bariatric uh, procedure? Uh, no, our policy is not to take it out if there is no symptoms from the gallstone disease. If they have symptoms like any other patient with or without gastric bypass, we have the same approach. If it's symptomatic, we can do it. Um, depending a little bit on the cause of the gastric <laughs> bypass operation, if that turns out to be very complicated and technically difficult, we wait a few uh, months and take the gallbladder out later and take the risk of uh, more more symptoms. Okay, good.